Um, like Paul says, I'm concluding our series on the promises of God. And there have been some great preachers that have specifically looked at specific promises. We've not covered them all because there are that many of them. So, you know, one of the things I would encourage you to do is have a look at the different promises that God gives to us. And, you know, think on those things. Find the one for you in the season that you are in and just focus upon it. Um, And I just wanted to conclude our series this morning by talking about waiting. That's something we all like, isn't it? (laughs) I don't like waiting at all. But you know, as we've looked at the promises of God over the last few weeks, you may have particular promises that you're holding on to and believing for, and yet you may feel like, I'm not seeing fulfillment on this promise. You've spent all these weeks talking on the promises of God, and yet... I'm just not seeing this promise come to fruition in my life. I've just completely missed the buzz. The buzz went and I missed it and I ran down the road and it just kept on going. And that promise has left me high and dry. You may feel exhausted in the waiting for a particular promise that you're holding on to. It can be exhausting. You know, you may feel, I don't even know if I believe in the promises of God. I've waited for some promises that long. I don't even know if they're true. God, are you even real? Is that a really bad thing to say from the stage? Because let's be honest, that's the truth of how we all feel some days. You know, and sometimes sin and trauma and anger can cloud our view of God. And if we believe that God is a promise keeper and that he fulfills those promises, then there are things that can get in the way of that. Let's look what the Bible's got to say, hey? Lamentations 3, 25 and 26 in the NIV says this. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't very often wait quietly. I will moan about it and complain about it and spit my dummy out and throw my toys out the pram because I am fed up awaiting and I don't have very much patience. And in the process, God continues to teach me that patience is a good thing and it is a virtue. So thank you for that. But you know, waiting can be difficult. But I really believe that waiting is intrinsically linked to hope. And if we have hope in our waiting, then it can transform and change the waiting process and the waiting period. You know, waiting can build excitement. If you've got something that you're waiting for and you're so excited about it and you just can't wait, like things like going back to school after the six week holidays, how exciting is that? Like things like getting married or going on holiday. We get so excited and so excited and so excited. And waiting can just add to that and be, actually be a quite exciting thing. But then sometimes waiting can be hard. It can be painful. And we can sometimes become hopeless in that. When we've got no surety that an end's going to come or that things are going to change. You know, sometimes we miss the point of what we're supposed to learn in the waiting. You know, very often as as you grow up and when you're younger, you'll say, oh, I can't wait until I'm this age. I can't wait until I finish school. I can't wait until I can drive a car. I can't wait until I get a job. (laughs) Yeah, wait for that. I can't wait until all these different things. And yet we miss, we miss the beauty of life in the waiting. And that hopelessness can be overwhelming sometimes. You know, and when we feel hopeless, we listen to lies. We listen to things that that say to us, you're not good enough. You won't get any better. Things are never going to change. It'll always be this way. When we feel hopeless in the waiting, you know, we go down a negative spiral and things just seem to get worse and worse. We think, well, I've got no friends. I've got no future. I'm just, I'm not worthy of it. I'm just a waste of space. And we go down this negative spiral about ourselves and think, well, everyone else is getting the promises of God all over their lives. What's wrong with me? And that negative spiral takes us down. You know, and hopelessness is contagious. Because if we feel hopeless in one area of our lives, it can very often spread into others. And like many things in life, if you're feeling hopeless... You will attract other people who are also hopeless, and then hopelessness abounds. But God wants to call us into a place of hope. God wants to take us somewhere else. 
So how do we inspire this hope in our lives? You know, hope comes out of love and worth and purpose. And God wants you to have hope on your good days, but also on your difficult days. On your days where things are going really well and on your days where things are just falling apart and you think, this is never going to change. God wants you to encourage you to keep that hope. So here's a few practical tips of how we can inspire hope in our own lives and for other people too. So here we go. Do what you can. How often do we just put too much pressure upon ourselves that we've got to be all the way over there or we've got to achieve all these wonderful things? Little steps are still steps. Do what you can. Do the thing you can in this moment, in this day. We also inspire hope by acts of kindness. It does other people good, but also, this is what scientists say, that when you, when you do an act of kindness, then it releases serotonin, which has an antidepressant effect. It also calms stress and helps reduce pain. So if you're feeling depressed or stressed or in pain, pain be kind. Winner. How else do we inspire hope then? Discipline your thinking. One of the biggest problems I believe we have in life is what we think and what we allow ourselves to think and the thoughts that pop into our head that we allow to stay there. But if we discipline our thinking, if we can take control of it and say, no, I don't want to think that. No, I don't want to agree with that thought. No, I'm no longer going to think that way and be negative about that or think the worst about that. But if we discipline our thinking and we stop generalizing, oh, it's always awful. Oh, it's always wet. Oh, it's always like this for me. Oh, it always happens to me. When we generalize, then it does make us hopeless. But actually, there's so many positive things if you look. Tell yourself that nothing is wasted. God turns things around for good. God uses things for the best. And I've been through some rubbish in my life, and I'm sure you have too. And when I look back on it, with the wonderful gift of hindsight, I think, actually, I came out of that all right. Actually, I learned something good through that, or I learned not to do that. I can see the positive in it. Because hindsight is a great gift. But when we don't have hindsight, we become hopeless. But if we continue to tell ourselves that things will get better, that I can move forward, and that nothing is wasted, then it will transform how we see what we're going through. We inspire hope by having positive role models. Like I said, when you're feeling hopeless, you attract other hopeless people. When you're negative, you attract other negative people. When you're difficult... You attract other difficult people and you're all difficult with each other. When you're happy, you attract happy people, sometimes. You know, when you're kind, you attract other kind people. My nan used to say to me, birds of a feather flock together. And I used to go, yeah, right, now, whatever. She went wrong. Birds of a feather flock together. You attract people like yourself. So have some positive role models. Have the courage to reach out to people who are positive, who are full of hope, who do have faith. Reach out to those people, especially when they tell you no or don't do that. Because that's the time when you need them the most. And that's the time when we want to tell them to go away, let's be honest. How else do we inspire hope? We pray. Pray. Ask God to change your thinking. Ask God to help you. Ask God to fill you with hope. Read the Bible. The Bible is full of stories of hope. Read it. They're in there. They will help you and encourage you. Also, we inspire hope by coming to terms with God's answers. Because sometimes the things we want aren't the things that God has got for us. But if we believe that God is a good God, and if we believe that God has got good plans and a good future for us, then we can come to terms with the answers that he has to our prayers so that we continue to move forward and continue to believe that even though I may feel hopeless because I'm not getting what I want, I need to trust that God's going to do something better and something greater in time. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite verses from the Bible 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You know, some days we need to remind ourselves. We need to remind ourselves of the promises of God in the Bible. So if you're not reading your Bible, you're not going to find them. They're in there. Read it. We need to remind ourselves of the promises that maybe people have spoken over our lives in prophetic words. What are they? Go back to them. Read them again. It's not lost. It's not forgotten. Remember what God has said over and through you, and it will help you in those difficult times to keep going. Corey Ten Boone said this, and Corey Ten Boone was, um, she was taken into a Holocaust camp. She was a Jew. She has got an amazing story. Please, please read it if you never have. She says this, let God's promises shine on your problems. Let God's promises shine on your problems. So if you do nothing today, go away, get a piece of paper, write your problems on one side, because let's be honest, we've all got some. If it takes more than one piece, it doesn't matter. And then find the promise that, ma- that goes with that problem and allow God to change your thinking about your problem and see faith and hope breathe and work through your life. You know, hope sometimes seems a hard thing to find, doesn't it? But I believe that hope has a name. And when we know where to look for hope, it's much easier to find it. We run around thinking, oh, I feel so desperate. I feel so hopeless. And, you know, where can I find hope in this? And we we grasp at things and we grasp at people and we grasp at, at circumstances and things that will make us feel better. And we try and change things sometimes just because it's like, I can't cope with this anymore. And yet if hope has a name, then there is somewhere that we can go that ultimately takes us to that place where hope is so we can be engulfed by it. Romans 5, 1 to 5 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only, but we also glory in our sufferings. Anyone glorying in the sufferings today? Maybe a little bit moaning about it and complaining about it. Not so much glorying in it. But we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and has been given to us. I believe that Jesus Christ is the saviour who carried the cross and is there to help me carry my burdens and is there to help me through my sufferings. I believe that when I'm weak and I can't go any further, he will actually carry me and help me go on. I believe that this death-crushing Jesus stands with me at the side of an empty tomb and says, this is not the end for you or where you are at. This is not the end where you think promises will never come true and that will never happen for you. I believe that that unseen but certain hope will energize your confidence, will defy life's deepest and darkest hurts, and will take you through the darkest of valleys. He finishes what he started. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And he is the living hope. And if we find him and stand with him, then his hope will fill us and will help us through whatever we face. If we hold on to hope, we hold on to Jesus. So let's go back to it, where we started, shall we? Let's go back to waiting. Because he's in the waiting. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Because I'm sure you're all waiting for something. Whether it's a good thing, or whether it's something that you hope will happen to change a circumstance that you're finding difficult or you're sad about. We're all waiting for something. And I want to ask you this question. Who is in the waiting room? with you. I 
I've sat in a number of waiting rooms in my life, I'm sure you have too. I don't find them best of places. I have a problem with patience. So I'll, I'll start to tap and I'll start to fidget and I'll flick through the magazine, but I don't really look at anything in it because I'm just thinking, I am waiting and I don't enjoy it. You know, and sometimes waiting rooms aren't nice places because it could be a waiting room where you're waiting for some results. Maybe you're waiting for a procedure. Sometimes when you're waiting for people and it's just like, come on, I can't wait anymore, hurry up. When you're waiting for what is to come, it makes a huge difference if somebody's with you in the waiting room. Have you ever sat in a waiting room on your own and then sat in one with somebody else? Now, depending on who it is, it might not be better. But generally, <laughs> generally, it is better if somebody is sitting with you. Sometimes you sit in waiting rooms and you get to talk to one of those people who wants to tell you everything that's wrong in their life too. God give us grace for those people when we sit with them because actually they need Jesus. But when someone is waiting with you, it makes the world a difference. So why does this matter to us today? You could say, well, okay, I'll make sure I take someone with me every time I go for appointments. But it matters to us today because waiting in God is different than waiting on our own. If we are waiting in and with God in our circumstances for those promises, whatever it is, then it is a very different place to wait than waiting on our own. Suddenly, waiting has a purpose because we're no longer alone. In the New Testament in Acts 2, we come across two people who have been waiting for a long time. They're quite elderly people. And the names are Anna and Simeon. And we join the story in Luke 2. And if you want to read the whole account, it's there in Luke 2. Please go and look at it. But basically what is happening is Mary has given birth to Jesus. And in accordance with the purification law, then they have to go and they have to um, do an offering for Jesus. So they go to the temple to do this offering and while they're there, they meet two people. The first one is Simeon. Simeon is an old man. And when you look at what it talks about with him, he'd got an intimate relationship with God. God had made him certain promises. God had said to him, you won't die until you meet the Messiah. So he was doing some waiting. And in, in Luke 2, 26, it said, it had been revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple and Simeon knows that his promise is being fulfilled to him. And then as Simeon is talking to Mary and Joseph, Anna comes along. I think Anna is probably even older than Simeon, but there's nothing to suggest it particularly. Anna, Anna lived her life to worship and pray. She'd been widowed at a young age and then had spent the rest of her life just in the temple praising God. And when she sees what's happening between Simeon and Mary and Joseph, she goes over and she knows too that purpose has been fulfilled in her life. She'd spent all her life in that temple and suddenly the waiting had purpose. The waiting had destiny. There was fulfillment in the waiting. Because what do we find for both of them? They were just waiting there. They were just going about the daily business. But what we find for them both in the waiting, they encounter Jesus. In the waiting, there's historical and prophetic significance. The waiting was suddenly worth it. And I said before about hindsight. When there's no hindsight available for your situation because you're still going through it, that's the place where we have to learn to trust God. And that's what I believe that Anna and Simeon had done. They'd learned to trust God that he would fulfill his promises that he had spoken over their lives. They had God in the waiting with them. They held on to the promise. They held on to those words that God had said to them. And they waited and believed that they would see Jesus. I want to encourage you this morning. In your waiting, hold on and believe that you will encounter Jesus in that place. Hold on and believe that there is significance in the waiting. It is worth it. And learn and ask God to help you to trust him in a new way. C.S. Lewis says this. Think of yourself just as a seed 
patiently waiting in the earth, waiting to come up a flower in the gardener's good time, up into the real world, the real waking. You know, if God is that gardener and we are the seed, why do we spend so much time worrying and striving in the waiting? If the gardener provides everything that that seed needs to grow, then surely God will provide everything that we need to grow and flourish in where we find ourselves. God is in the waiting, is in the growing, is in the fulfillment of who you are and who he calls you to be. And yet how often do we miss God in our hopelessness because we are looking to find him in the end results. We are looking to find him in the relief that comes when our circumstances change. And yet God is there in the hopelessness, in the pain, in the desperateness, in the frustration, in the I can't cope with this anymore. I just, it's just too much. God is there in it. If we will look for him, ask him to speak to us. You know, you may be waiting. You may be waiting for healing. You may be waiting for a relationship. You may be waiting for a new job. You may be waiting for a breakthrough in some area. You may be waiting for things to just get better. You may be waiting for so many things. And yet God says he's not in what you find at the end of it. But he is here right now in the waiting. And he wants to hold you and remind you that you are loved and say to you that you are not alone, that he never leaves you or forsakes you in that place. But in that place, he has a hope and a future for you. Hold on to him. His name is Jesus. He is the everlasting hope. I want to read you a quote by Anne Frank. Anne Frank again was taken to a concentration camp. She was a teenage girl. She'd been hidden for a long time. And again, has written some amazing things for the things that she went through. And this is what this teenage Jew wrote during World War II. Where there's hope, there's life. It fills us with fresh courage and makes us strong again. God is in the waiting and in your trial and suffering, he wants to bring you hope and life and strength. Stay steadfast and hold on to him. Have courage and hope. Trust in him because he won't let you down. There is victory in waiting. There is victory in waiting. The disciples thought that Jesus was dead and buried after he died on the cross. And yet in the waiting, he defeated death and hell and stole the keys. And now there is victory and hope for us all. That we no longer go to a lost eternity. But in and through him, there is a hope. There is a way. There is eternal life. And your life no longer has to be the same again. You know, God makes the promise. Faith believes it. Hope anticipates it. And patience waits for it. And I want to pray for you a verse from the Bible from Romans 15, verse 13 from the message. And I just want to pray it over you this morning, whether you're at home or in the building. And then we're going to sing a song called Take Courage. And as I pray this scripture over you, I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit again or for the first time. If you never made a commitment with Jesus, you can do this as we pray now and say, Jesus, I don't know what's going on, but right now I want to say, help me. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I want to come to you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you as my living hope. So let's just stand and I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you this morning. Come and fill this place. 
Come and fill people's lives. God, where there is hopelessness, I pray that you would breathe hope. Where there is despair, that you would breathe faith. God, may your promises be a bedrock for our lives. But when we have to wait for them, may we not turn from you, but may we draw closer to you. God, help us, I pray. God, and as we, as we pray this scripture over people's lives, I pray that you would do a deep and lasting work. Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. Amen.